me give you just a couple of things here tonight. First Peter, if you would, please. We'll be starting into Titus now, um, Lord willing, on Wednesday night. And I appreciate very much the prayers and the concern and the kindness. And uh, we have a great opportunity that has been given us to, to be able to minister. Um, let's see, rather, uh, um, is it Congressman now Rutherford called uh, to check in? That used to be, he used to be Sheriff Rutherford here, called to check yesterday and is very much aware of everything that is going on and uh, said, call me brother. He said, Brother David, now he used to be my chief. He said, Brother David, I want you to know, and I'm praying for you. And uh, here's his, here was his statement. He said, Brother David, he said, uh, I want you to know I'm praying for you. I said, I'm praying for you too, sir. And he said, well, he said, you better be. Amen. Because if God's not behind all this, he said, he better work this out because it's a mess. <laughs> so, He's a Christian man, he's a good man, but he, he, he's, when you get that high up, it's easy to forget that people are still going through things, and he took the time to call the family yesterday, and so uh, and it's, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity for us to have to minister to other people and to show them what we have that makes us somewhat different than them. You know, in the law enforcement community, you deal with that stuff so much, you tend to get hardened toward it. You see it so often, and you lose sometimes the human side of that, and uh, this has an opportunity for them to consider eternity. Um, so uh, a lot of people thought, and matter of fact, uh, one of Brother Monroe's names, I'm sorry, it's just kind of on my mind, so I apologize, it's an overflow bit. Uh, one of his names was, you know, they called him Bulletproof. Because they never thought that, of, you know, he went in the hospital, but oh, well, he'll walk back out. I mean, if anybody's going to beat the odds, he would because he had a history of doing those things. And, uh, and when it got him, it, it showed and is an opportunity to show that it's going to get all of us and that they need to be making uh, uh, long-term plans for where they're going to spend eternity. Amen. Nothing more important than that decision right there. We might make a mess along the way and we might, you know, be hypocrites. We might be everything else. Nothing more important than knowing that when you draw your last breath for whatever way you're taken out, that you're absent from the body and present with the Lord. So that's a great gift to be able to give somebody. All right, 1 Peter 5. Now I want to just give you this because I, I want to remind you uh, who can be behind you, who, who can be behind circumstances at times to take advantage of situations and to mess with your mind uh, on situations that happen like this. It doesn't make sense. It's too early. It's too, he's too young. Uh, he's a good Christian, this and so on and so forth. Uh, the devil's the one that spins that uh, along the way. Remember, Jesus was only 33 years of age when he died. Uh, willingly, understandably so, but he willingly died. Most of the apostles, with the exception of John and maybe it looks like Paul, were relatively young when they passed away. And so one of the things that you have to recognize is, is that the devil will come along and he'll say, well, now if God's such a good God, why is he taking Christians out? Why did he take your daddy, he said to me at 64, or Jim at 54, or, you know, why did he let Dr. Ruckman go till 94, but then he'd, you know, uh, let him go the way that he went? Why did all of those things take place? That's not God doing that. That's the devil making you doubt your God like the devil knows more than you do. Now, God can see, as Sophie sung about, Sister Sophie sung about this morning, God can see an element of things, the old preacher used to say, that we can't see. Well, what you have to recognize is, is that we can't see down the road where he is and he knows exactly what he's doing, but it's hurtful and it's painful not to recognize and it feels almost like a betrayal that when that happens to say, well, God knows what he's doing. Well, he does, but the devil's going to go, well, yea, hath God. God said, Amen. because you care about him, because you love him, because you want to be there with him, and because you think life would be so much better as long as they were there. And for whatever reason, God lets them be taken out of the way. And you can try to explain it, but you can't explain it. That's right. Amen. You can't explain it, as the old preacher would say, with an explaining machine. You don't know what God's doing, why God's doing it, or the way God's doing it. It doesn't make any sense at all to you. But when you step over to the other side, you'll be like, oh, man, well, I didn't see that. Well, none of us saw it. None of you can see it. But let me just give you a little bit of a warning here. Notice what he says in 1 Peter chapter number 5. I'm not going to preach on the, a message on the devil. I'm going to show you how God is using things to temper you, to prepare you, to get you ready for certain things so that he can
can advance you for a good cause and make you more mature, to make you more aged, to make you more valuable in His sight. Verse number 6, 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you when? Not now, in due time. What is that time? Due time is His time. In due time, and then He says this, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Right behind it, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom may devour. Now watch, whom resists steadfast in faith, knowing that the same... Do you see the word? Yes. Afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. What, do, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that the devil will try to use your afflictions to make you think that God's not a good God and God's not done something that, doing something to you that he hasn't done to other people. And why is it that you're having to go through this? And the Lord says to you in this passage, he said, Whom resist steadfast... Be aware, be sober, be vigilant. Whom resists steadfast, uh, be careful. Understand that He uses those afflictions to make you think that God's not taking care of you. Now here's what God does with the trouble. Look in verse 9. Whom resists steadfast, faith knowing that same afflictions are accomplished uh, with your brethren that are in the world, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. After that you have... What a drag, man. But that's what he says. After that you suffered a while, seasoned you, is what I have written in my Bible. <laughs> Suffering seasons you. Uh, I, I'm not a cook at all. I, I do pretty good with peanut butter and jelly or almond butter and mayonnaise or I can cut, chop up a banana and put that on there and I do okay with eggs or, you know, something sausage, what along those ways. Monroe was a good cook, I mean, literally. He was like a chef. He could cook. He could make deer meat taste like roast beef. But, but uh, when you kill that many deer, I guess you better learn how to cook it one way or the other. But, but at any rate, uh, I'm not much of a cook, but I can tell when something needs, uh, needs, needs uh, some... Uh, Salt and pepper. I mean, at least salt and pepper. After that you've been seasoned a while, what is that? It makes it taste better. Add just a little pinch of stevia, a little pinch of sugar, just a smidgen of that, a little sweet taste in there makes things better. But more importantly, savory things. I like steak. I enjoy eating steak. Uh, chicken too, fish too, but I'd prefer if I had a, a, a druther, I like steak. Uh, a ribeye that's been cooked just right, about medium and got enough fat in it. You say, well, I like the taste of it. But even a ribeye doesn't taste good if you don't put a little bit of salt. Salt enhances the flavor of the meat. It's not supposed to overtake the meat. Now the Lord's talking to you now about He's tempering you while He's seasoning you. He's making you to the point where you'll be more beneficial. You'll taste better to other people, but there's only one way to accomplish that. He has to put you in the crock pot and put you on slow roast. He leaves you sitting in there and he comes by and he cuts up some taters and some carrots and some celery. And whether you eat celery or not, that's like eating stiff grass or whatever. But you cut up the, the celery, you cut up the onions, you cut up the carrots and the potatoes. And, and then it begins to make juice. You add a little bit of flour in there to make a little bit of a, of a whatever that stuff is, a roux. And then you let that meat cook in there and then you check it and it's just as tough as it can be. And you set it in there on about 225 degrees and you leave the thing set all day. If you try to eat it before it's ready, it's like eating a piece of rubber off of a tire. But the longer it sits in that heat and sits there with all those vegetables and that salt and that pepper and the, whatever you choose to use as seasoning, by the time you pull that thing out, it's like the best ribeye you had at Ruth Chris's Ruth Chris Steakhouse or whatever steakhouse you like, Chop House or whatever they are. The point I'm making to you is, is that a Christian has to understand you're in a stew pot. God's trying to make it better so that your brand of Christianity is more easily devoured by other people and He can only do that by tenderizing you. That comes by you sitting in the pot. That means that when God has a, God lets you go through, people say, well, why does He put us through trouble? To soften you up, to season you, to make you a better minister. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says that I put you through trouble. I'm paraphrasing. I put you through trouble so that anybody, that any trouble or any tribulation, you can go minister to them because you've been through that trouble. That's a seasoning pot. That's you sitting in the crock pot and the crock pot sitting there. The old crock pots had three temperatures, low, medium, and high. And that's it, nothing else. 
And then I think the new ones came out with warm, low, medium, and high. So you could put it on warm after it's over. And you set that thing in the morning when you leave, and them taters are as hard as a ping pong ball, and them carrots feel like you could drive them through a two by four. And you throw all that stuff in there and you put just, you know, about so much water in there and put that big old, looks like the north end of a southbound mule, and you throw that thing in there. And then you put the lid on it and it sits all day. But boy, when you come back in that house that evening time, can you turn the air conditioner on? It's not just me. It's not just women either. It's hot in here, ain't it? It's 90 degrees outside. February the 28th, 90 degrees. Snow my foot, sun, <laughs> lots of it. <laughs> it's supposed to still be winter time. It's like, okay, well, I'm... Anyway, you walk back in that house in the evening time, you've been thinking about that roast all day long, and you're wondering, did it get burned? Did it get tough? Did it get this? Did it get that? You walk in that house, and that whole house doesn't smell like a house. It smells like a home. Right. You say, what are you going to have? Good. A home-cooked meal. You're going to have a meal that's going to taste good to you. It's going to be tender. It's going to be soft. It's going to be properly seasoned. Well, if you can understand that when you go through trouble, God's just got you in the crock pot. Amen. God's trying to make you where you're delectable, you're appealing, there's something about you. It's not your, your aroma that comes from perfume or whatever. It's the aroma that comes on you from bearing the marks in your body that Jesus Christ lets you go through so that you can then minister to other people and they pick up on the fragrance of your suffering like the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon and they say there's something about that person right there that's different than anything I've seen. Boy, I sure would like to taste that. You know what the Lord says to the boys? He says, taste and see the Lord, for He is good. The Lord gets ready to talk to those boys and He gets ready, takes that bread and He holds that bread up and He breaks the bread and He prays over the blessing over that bread and them boys are fixed to eat fresh bread right out of the pan and they look and they think to themselves, boy, there's one thing to have bread, but it's another thing to have bread that God's blessed. Amen. If you understand the principle that God gave you the privilege of suffering to season you, it's not to punish you. It's not to beat you up. You Christians here ought to be beyond that now. You ought to know that God can put you in the spanking machine. You ought to know that if you're out of fellowship with the Lord, if you stay straying too long, He's going to run you down and may run you over. But, but, but suffering for a Christian, once you get... Paul never says when he goes through suffering, Paul doesn't say, well, I wonder what I did now. Paul took one whipping he didn't have to take and Paul learned his lesson fast. Everything else, Paul never... You don't find anywhere in the Pauline epistles where the Apostle Paul is saying... Well, I guess I'm being chastised for what I did before, the past things I did and I, when I uh, put people in prison and I killed people and I, I was out of the will of God and not doing I guess God still punished me for that. Paul knew clearly what God was doing. Paul says about the, about the Lord, he said, He sent a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh, to buffet me, to keep me down, to hold me down, that I not be exalted above measure. I besought the Lord three times about that. And the Lord said, My grace is sufficient for you. Paul became a well-seasoned Christian. He became appealing to other people. He became something that somebody said, I'd like a bite of that. Not in the physical sense of biting your flesh, but in the sense of it's attractive to people. It has a tendency to change the aroma of the room. Let me see if I can make the illustration a little bit more clear. Mary comes into the room over there. If you think about it, there's probably some roast lamb that's there, maybe some mashed taters and, and Lord only knows what. Radishes over there in the Middle East is a big deal. I eat a lot of raw radishes. They're supposedly good for digestion. I, I don't know, but they had them at every meal when we were over there. And all that food is out there and they probably got, you know, Arabic coffee or, or Israeli coffee or whatever it might be and, and maybe some tea and things like that. There's all kind of different aromas that are in there. And when Mary comes in there, she breaks the box and immediately, because that box is broken, it changes the odor, the perfume, the smell of that room is immediately taking on the smell of a broken box. What God does when He puts you into a crock pot, when God puts you in there on simmer and He lets you cook, He's tenderizing you so that when somebody comes and lifts off the lid, they say, my goodness, boy, doesn't that smell good? Boy, doesn't that just like the broken box with Mary? The Lord loves to use broken vessels. The Lord loves to take that vessel that's been on the potter's wheel and it's not any good and it's not of any value and he the potter takes it out and busts it on there on the ground. You think, well, it's over and done with. He picks up those shattered pieces and he grinds them to powder. He adds a little bit of water. He puts it back up on the wheel and he begins to make the pot like he wants it to be. But God always deals with cracked pots better than he does with whole pots. That's funny. 
Miss Barbara got it. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. Y'all need to catch up a little bit. God deals well with cracked spots. You say, why? Light shines better through the cracks. It's not about being perfect. It's about being seasoned. It's about that old piece of china that's up there on the, uh, on your, in your china cabinet. It's up there on your shelf. You know, the one that Grandma used to serve gravy in. The one that has all the, the memories to it. It's got chips in it. It's got cracks in it. And, but you won't throw the thing away. It ain't worth to a plug nickel, but it has memories attached to it. And every now and then you'll take it down. You won't fill it too full because you don't want it to run out of the crack. But you put it in there just because it's valuable to you because of how it it got cracked. Yeah. Do you understand? Sure. God's using the trouble. I'm, I'm a little exhausted, a little worn out, a bit weary with Christians who haven't been taught about this principle. And what happens is they're always expecting this prosperity and everything's going to go great. You probably, since you've been saved, have had more trouble than you would have had if you hadn't have got saved. You say, why? It's a gift. It's given unto you on behalf of Christ. Amen. Philippians chapter number one, not only to be saved, but to suffer for his sake. Amen. That's what he says. You say, why? It makes you seasoned. It makes you taste good to other people. It makes, uh, it makes the God you serve real to them. The God we preach at times, the God I've preached in the past historically, maybe 25 or 30 years ago, was a God that had very few people to be able to attain to it because you keep moving the bar up. You keep moving the bar up. You keep adding to it and adding to it. And you got to do this. 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 And eventually you got it so high they can't even get their hands around it. And so you know what they do? They get so frustrated they give up. They never learned about a relationship with the Lord. All they keep learning is I got to just keep busy and I got to keep doing more and I got to keep adding and I got to keep adding. You can't help anybody with that. You know what a seasoned Christian will do when somebody's going through what they're doing? They'll do what you people did yesterday and today. They'll bring a, 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 a crock pot full of vegetables, a crock pot full of meat, some cookies and some candies and some, some things that, you know, you're going to eat too much of and probably get sick and be happy the whole time you're eating it. And, and breads and cakes and pies and, and cookies. You say, what is that? It's well seasoned. How come it is that during times of tragedy you think of food? Well, you're supposed to represent the bread of life, aren't you? Yeah. You're supposed to bring, represent the water of life, aren't you? Yeah. Are you getting the picture? Amen. God's trying to turn you into a meal for somebody else. Amen. He's trying to use you so that you get down to their level and so that you can help feed them when they're in times of trouble and difficulty. But you can't do it until you've been in the oven yourself. You've got to simmer in the crock pot. And instead of just looking to jump out of the pot, just say, okay, Lord, hurry and get me done. <laughs> There's a martyr. It's back there in my book, Martyr's Mirror. By the way, baby, that, that uh, book is on the bottom of right-hand shelf, about the second or third book over on the left if you wanted to take it home. I, I remembered it yesterday. But at any rate, Martyr's Mirror, and there's a story in there of an individual, and he's being roasted. They put him on a spit. They tied him hands in his feet like this, and they got him over there, and he's burning underneath that thing. And, of course, people are laughing and hollering and all that other kind of stuff. And he finally gets the guy, the executioner's attention, and he said, uh, I think I'm done on this side. Could you turn me over now? That's a, that's a true story. How would you do that? He's like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm done here, man. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm almost where I'm going to be worthy for somebody else to partake of. Here you are way up in 2021. That's back in the 1500s, 2021, seven, 800 years later, 600 years later. And you know what you're doing? I'm telling you a story about a guy who said, turn me over. And your bells are ringing for him up in heaven. They had a preacher out there. He was known as a white horse preacher. He preached for years. This is in the 1600s and so on and so forth. And they finally brought him up on charges of preaching against the state and preaching against the government and preaching against liquor and preaching against this and that and the other. And they took that preacher out there into the middle of the square and they strung him up and hung him out there and took him and stripped him from the waist down. He's just bare chested. He's out there like that. And that preacher's standing there like that. And the big crowd gathers the people he'd been preaching to and talking to. And he gets up there with a whip and he begins begins to whip that guy and whip that guy and he passed out a couple of times, the story is told, and then he's holding on to those ropes and gritting his teeth and all that and the executioner gets up there with that old sulfuric breath and those old busted out teeth in his mouth and rotten smell out of hell itself, comes up and says, what do you think about that whipping there, preacher? What do you think about that? You know what the preacher's response was? Young man, it's as if you have whipped me with roses, with rose petals, he said. Turn me over, I'm about done on this side, but I'm not all the way done. 
How does a Christian do that? A Christian understands the principle that after you have suffered a while, the Lord's going to do some things for you, but the suffering is intended to tenderize you to make you more beneficial to Him, to make you more usable by Him, to make you more edible and more acceptable to other people. Uh, sometimes we get this idea that Christianity is supposed to be God's like uh, Santa Claus up there in heaven. A white hair and a white beard and a big red suit and stuff like that. All of that comes out of the Bible. And all you have to do is just ask God and He gives you. He don't always give you. And sometimes you know what He does? He'll give you instead of what you think you ought to get, He won't answer your prayer, won't give you anything in place of it. Or sometimes He gives you suffering where you're looking for something different. You say, why? Tenderize you. Tenderize you. Soften you up. Take the edge off a little bit. Make you pliable. Make the odor of the room change when you come in. You ever been around a real Christian that's been through it? They say Harlan Popoff was that way. I never got the privilege of meeting him. I've read a lot of his material and stuff. That's the guy that used to preach to himself in prison. He preached to God in prison. <laughs> he preached to the other people in prison and stuff like that. They beat him. They tortured him. They did all kind of things. They say when that guy would come in the room before he'd get up on the platform to preach and stuff that you could sense he was in the room without even knowing who he was. You say, what was that? Completely tenderized. Yeah. Completely seasoned, just the right amount of salt and pepper, ready now to have an opportunity to witness or to be able to speak to people. I would never want this, and I pray and hope God would never do it to me. I don't want to try to prove him wrong. I don't want to try to prove what a man I am or any of that kind of stuff. I can't imagine a man by the name of like uh, David Ring. He's from right here in Jacksonville. And uh, I knew my dad and those kind of things and twisted up with cerebral palsy and all this stuff and, and get up there and they say, the boy, get up in the pulpit if you've ever heard him preach. He used to preach. Now, I don't know what he's doing now. He might be a wicked life for all I know. I doubt it, but he might be. But I remember this. Many times he'd be up in the pulpit and they'd start singing a song about victory in Jesus. Oh, victory in Jesus. Uh, Jesus, my Savior. And he stopped a congregation of people one time and said, I got cerebral palsy. What's your problem? Seasoned, yeah. softened, salted, partake of his afflictions, his trouble, his problem, to put you on the spot to say, could you let God use you to season you that way after that you've suffered a while? Would you let God put you through that so that you'd be more pliable, more usable, easier for God to throw you up on the wheel and make you what he wants you to be instead of what you want to be? Lord, I sure would like to be a saucer. I want you to be a pitcher. Requires a lot more squeezing, a lot more uh, bending, and a lot more uh, uh, emptying out of the vessel to make it what I need it to be. Lord, I just think it'd be easier to be a plate. <laughs> but what if I want you to be a pitcher Amen. after you've suffered a while? Would you be willing to do that? You know the passages on suffer. You've been here in this church long enough to know what those passages are. Look at the passage right there. He said, after that you have suffered a while to make you what? Perfect. Look in Hebrews chapter number 11. To make you perfect. Yeah, to make you perfect for what? For the benefit of other people. It's not to perfect you for going home to heaven. He says in Hebrews 11, chapter number 40, that's the heroes of the faith that you're looking through there. And then he comes down to the end of that, some of the most horrible difficulties and sufferings that you see. Look at it. He talks about Rahab the harlot there, and then he talks about uh, Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. And then he talks about stopping the mouths of lion in verse 33. Watch, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness made strong, wax valiant and fight, turn to flight the armies of the aliens, women receive their dead, raise to life again, others tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had a trial of uh, cruel mockings and scourging, yea, more over bonds and imprisonment. You don't hear a charismatic preach on that. They don't open their cotton picking mouth. That's your heroes of the faith. That's your heritage. That's where you come from if you're saved. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They had pennies from heaven. They all drove Bentleys and Cadillacs and lived in big five homes and had health and wealth and all their kids grew up to be Einsteins and went to Stanford and went to Harvard and went to Yale and graduated and went to law school and became doctors. No, that's a different group altogether. They were tempted and slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins being destitute, afflicted and tormented. That's your heritage. You know what it is going about in sheepskin? Have I told you that before? I think I've told you that before. What they would do is wet a sheepskin. You ever take a, a leather, uh, 
uh, a pair of good boots and all that kind of stuff. You get leather shoestrings in them. This is back in the days we used to wear brogans. And you get those leather shoe straps like that, and the first thing you better do before it rains is you better soak those and let them dry out. You say, why? Because when they're like this, they're real supple. But when they get wet one time, they, they shrink. You ever tan hides before? If you ever tan a hide, when you get all the fat and stuff scraped off of that thing, part of that tanning process involves heat. You say, what does it do? It shrinks the skin. So what they would do is, is they would take that sheepskin and they would wet that sheepskin down, soak the hair and the fur on the, the fur, <laughs> the wool on the sheep, and then they would sew that individual up in that thing. And then that individual, nobody was allowed to help them, so they're sewn up. So they would wander around, and as that sheepskin began to dry out, it get tighter and get tighter and get tighter and get tighter until it squeezed the life out of them. You say, who is that? That's your heritage. You know what the Lord says about them? Look at the next verse. God's opinion of the ones that were so despicable to the world that they wanted to torture them, put them in the crock pot, burn them up, let them be eaten by lions and tigers and bears and be laughed at and mocked and get scourged and have their children handed to them dead and so on and so forth. Look at what God says about them. Of whom, what does it say? God said, somebody that's seasoned in the crock pot, the world ain't even worthy of them. You say, why? Heavenly, heavenly tasting. That food was so heavenly, man. It tasted so good. It was unbelievable. Now look, if you will, please, in verse 40 in that passage. We're talking about suffering. We're talking about perfection. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made. You get to get in on it. But you don't have to go that route. But that's what God put them through so that they would learn some things. Look in Hebrews chapter 2. By the way, the book of Hebrews is a great book if you want to read about better things. Just make sure you rightly divide it when you go through. Hebrews chapter 2. I like that, you Bible students. I can tell the ones of you that have been through the Bible and you didn't lie your way through it. I like it because I can tell you know how to rightly divide it. You can see the pitfalls in Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews. You can get yourself twisted. Hebrews chapter number 2. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 10. The Bible said, For it became him from whom are all things, and by him who are all things, and bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain of their salvation. Do you see that? Well, I thought God was already perfect. He was as God, but as a human being, in order to perfect him, he had to uh, teach him something by suffering. The Lord said that he learned things, uh, he endured suffering. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And I'll think about that a minute. If you would, just consider for a second. I'll try to hurry, but I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I want you to get the point. God came down here. Nobody could ever tell God what to do. And now he's dwelling in the body of a man and he has to learn how to be obedient to his own creation by submitting himself to suffering. Shall I say seasoning? Shall I say tenderizing? I told you and I didn't get around to it this morning. The Lord changed the message on it. And Moses is over there in the book of uh, Exodus and he says to the God the Father, he said, show me your glory. He'd never seen God the Father. He doesn't even know what he looks like. At that point, he hadn't even seen the bottom of his feet there. He said, uh, show me thy glory. And the Lord shows him a theophany. He shows him a pre-incarnate Christ. He shows the pre-incarnate Christ walking across there and being everything that he as a holy God couldn't be. And it wasn't a sinner. It's merciful and gracious and long-suffering and caring and loving. And a holy God can't be those things because he's holy. You wouldn't have any connection if he didn't come down here and get seasoned. You couldn't partake of him. You know what he said? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now you know that that's not cannibalism. You know what he's doing is making a picture of the bread and the grape juice. But you know what he's doing? It's perfectly seasoned. For the joy set before him, he endured the what? Cross. He suffered and bled and died. You say what? Tenderized. Makes him easy to accept, doesn't he? Isn't that the kind of leader you can follow? The kind of guy that doesn't demand out of you more than he's willing to do himself. The kind of guy that leads from the front and says, I'll do it before you do it. I'll, I'll set you an example. But we can't even grasp what it was like for him to leave the portals of glory up there on the, in eternity and step down here to time. Confine God to time. 
He bound himself up, put himself in the body of a human being. That's a God that knows how to get from one end of the universe to the other in a matter of thought. And here he's a human being laying on a pile of dead fish in the back of a boat saying, I'm tired, I'm trying to get a nap and y'all worried about a some storm. I'm, I'm hungry. Here he is on the cross as a human being. I thirst. Feeling the desertion of the Father as a man. My God, my God, not my Father. All the natures right there. All of his deity right there together and that kind of a thing. You say, what's he doing? Fixing it so that you can partake of him and he can partake of you. Seasoning. Suffering. Tenderizing. What's the stuff they used to put on uh, beef? It smells uh, funny. It's got a little chef guy on it. It ain't Chef Boyardee. It's not spaghetti sauce. It's, you, you shake it out there and you fram it with a hammer. Um, it's some kind of meat tenderizer. What's the name of the meat tenderizer? Well, it came in a little white bottle like that and it had yellow around the bottom of it and black writing on it and it said accent. And you dump it on there and then you beat it in there with a hammer and they're telling you that it's the, the seasoning that's making the meat tender. Well, if that's the case, then why you got to beat, the, beat the, the, the steak with a hammer? You, but you're telling me that it's the, ten, it's the, the accent that's made. Oh, my foot, man. It's that claw that you got in your hand. The one we had had the little dimples on the bottom of it. Man, if you hit somebody with that thing, I mean, they would, they'd look like a waffle, walking waffle the rest of their life, man. That's some deadly stuff. You know, but you, you, almost, you almost feel like you got power, you know, it's... And you're hitting that stuff and you take a steak about that big and the time you're done, it looks like a sheet of paper. And you hold it up, it's kind of like, that's tender now, baby. <laughs> yeah, it's the accent. <laughs> no, you don't beat the stuffings out of it, right? Well, I got better. I learned that you hit that stuff too hard. It splatters everywhere, you know. <laughs> so you learn to cover it up with saran wrap, but you got to be careful <laughs> because you can... Hit it so hard that the plastic becomes part of the meat. <laughs> you don't know that till you throw it on the grill and it's like, what is that smell? It's like somebody's burning plastic, you know. It smells like a hefty bag on fire. <laughs> All right, take your Bible and come back if you will, please. Uh, make, I'm sorry, let's go one more. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm just trying to let you know God's, God's good. He knows what He's doing. Yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. Verse number 11. 411, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the perfecting of the saints, for the perfecting of the saints, not to make saints. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now let's think about it a second. Jesus Christ comes down, dwells as a man, he learns obedience by the things that he suffers. He goes out there and he gets hung up there and gets whipped and beat to death and beard plucked out and all those things that happened to him that were horrible and a crown of thorns on his head and a whip across his back and nails in his hand and nails in his feet and a hammer, I mean a spear in his side and he's hung up there on the cross to die and then he says, until you become the perfect man. One of the ways you perfect it is, is the Lord leaves you in the crock pot and you become tenderized. And guess what happens? Now you're starting to learn how it is to die daily. Amen. You didn't see that one coming, did you? No. You say, what did he do? The Bible says that when he came up out of Gethsemane, that he set his face like a flint for the joy that was set before him. He was already dead in his mind. He says, that's what I came to do. One of the ways that you can learn to have victory over your flesh and learn to die daily is, is to recognize that anything God puts you through is to season you, to prepare you for the day where you can have some victory over the flesh or whatever it is that's concerning you, giving you trouble or problem, and then it makes you where you become edible for other people. Amen. Just a couple more here. I'll try to hurry. Look, if you will, back in uh, the book of First Peter. First Peter. Notice he said that the purpose of your suffering, your seasoning, your cooking in the crock pot will say... Uh, not, like, uh, not like Jeffrey Dahmer, not like Harold Lucas, not, uh, you know, cooking uh, eyeballs and kidneys and other body parts in there and devouring hearts and cooking them with potatoes and all that. And you're reading some of that foolishness nowadays. You say, well, you're even an evil world. That's not what I'm talking about. 
I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm talking about letting the Lord tenderize your heart so that out of your abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And when people hear you talk, instead of hearing you talking about the brethren and talking and complaining about this and complaining about that and this trouble and that problem and this problem and this problem, that when you open your mouth, all that seasoning comes out. Boy, sure is God is good, isn't he? Boy, what a blessing. He sure is a blessing. I remember Miss Penny. Brother Woodard remembers Miss Penny. White-headed cotton top. Some of y'all remember. She used to be at the nursing home. Miss Penny, you know, she always, whenever she would talk, you never heard her talking about the things of the world. She was always thinking about where somebody was going to spend eternity. Whenever you'd see her, whether she'd sit over here just behind where Miss Roush was, she'd sit back where Grady and Lisa are sitting now. She'd come in every now and then, somebody pick her up and bring her there. I'd go over there to the nursing home way back in the day and get up there and get singing a few songs. And then she'd uh, raise her hand and she'd say, Tell him about hail, preacher. You say, what is that? Her mind's thinking about eternity. And then I'd get to running a little too long on that train, you know, and she'd say, for the love of the Lord, preacher, tell them about the love of Jesus. <laughs> you say, where's that come from? Seasoning. I preached that dear old saint's funeral over there at the old church that we used to be a part of years ago that my dad pastored. I was over there next to it or close to it today and uh, drove by there and just some memories and things. I preached that old saying there's over 400 people there and they say the majority of the people that were there are people she led to the Lord. You say, what is that? Seasoning. Seasoning. Not married. Lived life by herself. Her and her sister. Come to church. Love the Lord. Believe the book. Went out on her own. Not, didn't wait for door-to-door -door visitation on Tuesday night or Thursday night. Knock on the door. Hi, how are you? It's me and my sister. We just... Wanting to know whether or not you know where you're going when you die. It's the most important decision you never make. Could I talk to you a little bit? Who's going to return a, or turn down a little old cotton, head, cotton top old woman? Well, sure, Grandma. Come on in. <laughs> Sit down there, and I don't know what she must have said. She probably said, boy, sure, I've enjoyed the crock pot. I hope what I have to tell you tastes good to you. Boy, God sure has been good to me. I watched that old saint pass away over at Baptist Hospital South and just before she died I went in there to see her. I think my sister got over there before she passed away and I got over there and I'm sitting there and I was jacked up. It was after the nursing home and I'd gone down there and blistered it up to try to get there on time and I got up there. She had that big mask on and breathing that thing fogging up and then coming away and fogging up and going away like that and she looked down there, I looked, I looked uh, down there at her and she looked up and she, old blue watery eyes, you know, and she kind of cleared her eyes up like that and she said, well, hey, preacher. I said, hey, Miss Penny. I said, uh, how are you doing? She says, oh, I don't know. I, I guess I'm all right. I said, okay. And she had me read her the Bible. I got a little choked up. And I've told you the story before, but it, it just reminds me what good seasoning will do. And I've been there a few times in my life and should be able to compose myself, you know. But here's this dear old saint fixing to step out into glory. And she reaches over there and with that hand. That means give me, I, I said, yes, ma'am. Got her hands just like that. She takes that little old weak hand off that other right side of that bed and drags it across her body and puts it in mine there. Four hands right there, just stacked up like Oreo cookies, getting ready to dunk them in some milk. And we were like this, and she said, Now, preacher, I'm going to be just fine. I said, Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I know you're going to be fine. She said, But you got to get a hold of yourself. <laughs> you say, What is that? Well seasoned. Well seasoned sweet taste and she's on the way out you see what's she doing she's leaving me some crumbs under the table she's leaving me the last piece of cake on the plate she's saying here you go ahead and eat this I'm, I'm going to the other side I have meat you don't know nothing of preacher Man, what a way to go you say what after that he have suffered a while make you perfect establish you root you down get you hunkered down get you ready for a load that's coming your way. Notice what he says here in verse, uh, same verse that we were at just now. He said, after you suffered a while, make you perfect. Establish you. To establish is to strengthen you in a position. Look at uh, Colossians chapter number 2. 
I'll just give you this one and then I'll just give you the other two and you can look them up and I'll let you go on and go to the barn. Colossians chapter 2. Is it making any sense to you? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to prepare you. You say, why? Because if you're a Christian, God wants to use you. Can you imagine that? If you're a Christian, God wants you to do more than just uh, live right and spit white. That means you don't chew back her. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't cuss, you don't chew, you don't go with those that do. Is that all there is to the Christian life? The Lord's like, no, I didn't put you in the pot, man. You say, what? I'm quoting to you Romans 8, a different version of it. But he said, we're sheep for the slaughter. We're all counted as sheep for the slaughter. So what's he doing? He's offering you among wolves. You're sheep, and he's sending you out among wolves. You know what happens with sheep around wolves? They get hit up. <laughs> Ain't that what happened to him? He came as a lamb to be devoured. Colossians chapter number, uh, did I give you the passage yet? Colossians chapter number two, look in verse number six. And you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, there it is, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. You know what he said? He said, I've established you by the book, by preaching. I've established you to learn doctrinal things. I've established you by you getting rooted and grounded and where you're headed and what you're doing and let that become the foundation to your faith. You say, what? It's like being set in concrete. Certain things you don't get moved on. Doctrinal things you don't get moved on. Come back quickly to 1 Peter 5. I'll give you the last two. You can look them up in your own Bible study. Look, if you will, please. He said he would only use suffering the, the crock pot to make you suffer a while and to make you perfect, but to establish you and then also to strengthen you and to settle you. And let me say this about being strengthened. You know, one of the ways you get stronger is you keep adding weight. It doesn't take much when you're right at that brink and when you're right at that point. Brother Mitchell know what I'm talking about. When you get right at that point where you're trying to increase the weight and you're doing supersets and you're doing negatives and you're doing all kinds of different things to try to increase it and somebody can add two and a half pounds and what you could move easily, two and a half pounds, you can't even get it off the thinking rack. Whether it's squats, whether it's deadlifts, whether it's benches or whatever your thing, clean and snatch and, snatch and jerk and all the other stuff. You add just a smidgen of weight. But if you want to get stronger, you know what you have to do? You've got to add more weight than you can do. You know what he says? Being in the crock pot, it'll make you stronger than you ever knew you could be. You'll be able to endure things you never knew you could endure. But not till you've been through some hard times. It'll make you stronger. You know, the world makes fun of it. They make a joke about it. You know what they say? You know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> God's not trying to kill you. If he wanted to kill you, he could kill you. Yeah. You say, what's the trouble I'm going through for these things I'm reading to you now? To establish you. To make sure that you're getting more perfect. Just the right texture. Just the right tenderness. Just the right seasoning. And to strengthen you. To make you strong. You say, why? Because you're going to go through some things sometime that you can't make it through unless you look back on where you've been. Amen. The Apostle Paul says we're distressed and we're not forsaken and we're this and we're not this and we're this and we're not this and we're not that. You know what he says? We know that it troubles just for a while. Yes. You can go through anything if you know it ain't going to last long. Amen. Well, it ain't going to last long, but you need all your strength sometimes. Amen. Sometimes there's things that can take your strength out of you physically and it's not just the weight of a weight rack. Yes. Emotionally, you can yes. find out yes. things that break your heart, and the next thing you know, man, you're just as weak as a kitten. Well, the Lord says, you need emotional strength. You need spiritual strength. You need physical strength. What does trouble do? It strengthens you. You ever watch, I used to watch these guys, probably the best ones I've ever seen was uh, Israel sent a group over here. We were looking at SWAT teams and how they did different things and stuff like that, and they were doing demonstrations. I've never seen a more well-oiled machine. Now, they're paramilitary over there, so it's a little bit higher level than we were here. But to watch those guys go through their operations and do the thing is eight guys. But when you look at those eight guys, it looked like one guy because they were so succinct in everything they did. And so we were just talking, and I was listening to the, the, the big dogs talk to the other ones over there, and I'm just on the fly on the wall just listening to them. 
And they said, what do you think the secret is? And they said, training, 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 training. I talked to a guy here that was a, with a, did some black ops, and he was a SEAL team guy and that kind of a thing. And I said, how do you all train? He said, we train like we fight. I mean, it's not a game. It's not a show. It's not a put on so that when the real thing's there, it's not a shock to our system. We train like we fight. That's why sometimes they get hurt. But that's why when you're up to your head in the alligators, you're glad to see SEAL Team 6 show up or what's left of them. But at any rate, do you understand what I'm saying? God lets you go through certain things. You say, why? So when the world is falling apart around you, you can step up and do the job that you have to do because God strengthened you because you've been here before. I done been there, done that. God's got me through there and he got me through there and he got me through there and he got me through there and I got stronger every time along the way. And you know what I thought? When I went through that, I thought I'd never make through it. And I went through there and I never thought I'd make that through it. And I got through there and you know what he says over there in the book of Psalms? Yea, though I walk, what? Through. Through. That means you went through and came out the other side. When I went through that, Oh, you mean you came out the other side? Yeah, I came out the other... Oh, I did come out the other side. How did I, how did I do that? God got me through here and 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 I've gotten stronger along the way. You say, why? Because He brought me through. The incident didn't stop with whatever was going on. I came through it and out the other side. And then the last thing is, is to settle you. Why is that important? Well, ladies and gentlemen, he does that so that you know that no matter what happens to you, number one, that your salvation is not in question. So that every time trouble comes your way and the doctor comes knocking on your door with bad news or picks up the phone and calls you or you have to go to the hospital for a loved one or you have to bury somebody or whatever, that you're settled, that you know, well, God knows more about this than I do. And it's not just a saying. It's the pot talking. I don't mean the pot. I mean, I'm talking a crock pot. I've been there. I'm settled. I'm seasoned. I'm being perfected. I'm strengthened. But I'm settled that God knows what He's doing. And no matter what, I know in whom I am believed and am persuaded He is able to keep me against that day. That way when you go through trouble or when the virus comes or when the economy crashes or when China invades or when Kim Jong Huang or whatever throws a nuke and this and that and the other, I'm settled. Amen. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. My Amen. treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the settled. Why? Because during that time when everybody else is tearing their hair out and OMG in it and sending emojis all over the creation and the news media is going absolutely insane and they don't know what to do, you're like, oh, hum, man. Can't wait to get to church on Sunday. Amen. You watch a loved one pass from this side to the other side like that. You say, what are you doing? Settled. Yeah. Sad, but settled. Amen. You say what? That's crockpot talking. That's the crockpot talking. Now, I just want to try to let you understand something. God's not uh, the one that's making you think that God's done a bad thing and taken a loved one away. Amen. That's the devil. He took his own son away at 33. Y'all have heard the story. Many of you have heard the story before of the guy that said, you know, I want to know, ask a preacher. I want to know where God was when my son died. Real smart alecky. And the preacher just answered a fool according to his folly. He said the same place he was when his died. Oops. You're not going through something that God doesn't know about. And for you and I, it'll be over one day. It only gets better from here. No matter how bad it gets, when we step across the other side, it won't get no better than that. Don't let the devil crawl up on your shoulder and let you know because of things in the world and things that are happening with elections and things that are happening with physical problems and all that kind of stuff, that that means that uh, God's against you and, oh, what's God doing? Why is God doing this to me? No, God knows what He's doing. Amen. You have answers for it? I just gave them to you. He's just seasoning you. Just getting you ready. Say, why? He's going to serve you up sooner or later for the benefit of somebody else. The next thing you know, you'll be up there at the judgment seat of Christ and listen, and I'm done. And you'll be up there at the judgment seat of Christ and you'll be up there and all of a sudden somebody will tap you on the shoulder. And you say, how are you doing? 
I was watching you when you went through this and this and this right here, and because of what you did, I, I met that guy on that throne up there. I just want you to know I sure appreciate your trouble and trials and tribulation, your suffering, your persecution, because it made something attainable, because I understand that. I didn't understand uh, no smoking and no drinking and no cussing and no heroin and no cocaine and no crack and, and no sex and all. I didn't understand all that stuff. I didn't understand suit and ties and, and all that. I didn't understand that. But I know, I know suffering. I've been there. I, I understand pr trouble. I've been there. I understand death. I've been there. I, I got it. But I watched you handle it differently than me. You had hope during that. I'm sure I'm glad you did because I, I met him because of you. Amen. You think you'll regret that when you get there and see that? then your life will make sense. That's what you're here for. You're a cannonball to be shot at the enemy whenever God chooses to use you. And if you die in a spray of glory, then praise the Lord. But more likely, it'll be going through trouble and letting God use you like Lazarus as an illustration of how to help other people. Cheer up. That's a good thing. You're just in the crock pot. Starting to smell better. Right? Starting to get more tender. Starting to get softer. Starting to get all that old bleachy, worldly smell off of you and letting the juices of that meat come out to the top. You know, a good tenderloin on the grill cooked about 200 degrees, about 15 hours. You take out a fork and just sure does taste good. Now listen, and I'm done. Do you know why food tastes good? Because you smell it before you can taste it. When they smell the aroma of you in the crock pot, that makes him taste that much better. You can't taste if you can't smell. wonder if that's why he's the Rose of Sharon and the Lily of the Valley. Father, bless your word. We got a tough couple of days ahead of us, Lord. You've allowed us the privilege and Monroe's led the way to give us the opportunity to minister to his friends and to his family and to people that knew him as a friend but don't know his Savior. And you've allowed that for us to have that opportunity. We don't know how close we are toward the end. And I pray, Lord, that you might strengthen us physically, mentally, emotionally. Help us, Lord, to be able spiritually to minister to these people and that they might see something in us that would draw them to you. And may this time for our church be a benchmark. And it's not just the erection of a building, but seeing individuals drawn closer to you in spite of the tragedy that has befallen us. Please bless these people, Lord, for their kindness and for their generosity toward that family, for their outreach to that family. Lord, thank you for their testimony that has been borne upon their shoulders and more likely upon their lips. And help us now to endure these next couple of days, Lord, and to be a bright and a burning, shining light for thee, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.